All right, in this video, we're going to look at reversible processes and some of the reasons real processes are not reversible and then how we can um, take advantage of being able to imagine reversible processes. So the ideal process we're going to say is a reversible one. Now this is thermodynamically speaking, it's not a practical ideal. No real process will be reversible and really that's fine. It's not going to stop us from being able to analyze processes. Uh, it's just going to mean that we'll have to do a little bit of extra work. We're going to approximate reversible processes though whenever we operate really slowly and staying always near equilibrium. Okay, so now think about your car. Okay, this is one of the power devices I'm most fond of. But if I'm trying to go from work to home and it is operating very slowly, always near equilibrium, I will never get home. That's not my goal. Okay, so this isn't a practical ideal, but it is a thermodynamic ideal. Now, there are several reasons why real processes will never be reversible. Okay, number one is friction. Okay, friction is everywhere. We can't avoid it. It's going to be some sort of energy we cannot recover. Okay, another one is unrestrained expansion. Okay, so imagine I have a balloon, I pop it, and then I ask you to put it back together. That's not trivial, right? So Whenever I have explosions, this unrestrained expansion, that is not going to be reversible. If I have heat transfer through a temperature difference that's non-infinitesimal, that's going to be irreversible also. So imagine that I have a nice hot cup of coffee and I put it in a cold refrigerator and it heats up. Am I going to be able to say, okay, now run the refrigerator backwards and heat my coffee back up? No. So this is irreversible. Mixing is another one that's irreversible. If I had that coffee and I decided to cool it by dropping an ice cube in it. Okay, great. It cooled off my coffee. But now I say, yeah, well, I want my coffee warmer. Can you get that ice cube back out of there for me? You know that's not possible, right? These are things that basically we can just picture how much work and effort it's going to be to try and undo them. There are other things like electric, electrical production is not going to be irreversible. But these are the main bugaboos that are going to haunt us. Now, even though real life isn't reversible, we're still going to be able to study that. So we're going to go back historically now to the early 1800s when Saadi Carnot was sitting back out, French Revolution, and he's firing cannons. And there's a lot of dead time firing cannons, and so he's watching the cannon fire and thinking, and he keeps noticing that as the cannon rubs against the wood support holding it, that friction appears to be heating things up, and but he, it gets him thinking about stuff. Well, he had a lot of apparent time to think, and so what he came up with is this hypothetical ideal cycle. And so basically we start by doing a totally reversible and isothermal expansion. Okay, now this is going to happen at a high temperature, and this is going to absorb heat transfer from the high temperature reservoir. So maybe it was that cannon, the fire going off, okay, and it's going to bring heat into the cycle. Now next, I've got this stuff that's got a high energy, and I am going to let it expand. I'm going to do it without any heat transfer, but this is going to be a work process. And I'm going to go from this high temperature to a low temperature, and that's going to produce work. But now then I need to start trying to get it back to the original state. So let's compress it back isothermally, constant temperature. That's going to take heat out of the system. So it's going to reject heat to a low temperature reservoir. And then I'm going to compress it without heat transfer, which is going to require work input from TL to TH. Now, this is an impossible cycle to actually build. I can build some things that approximate it. 
So maybe I have something boiling here and then I'm going to allow it to expand by raising or uh, by lowering the temperature uh, just through expansion and then I'm going to cool it off maybe put it in an ice bath and then I'm going to compress it okay work input so I have heat in heat out I have work out work in now as he spent all this time thinking about this and then other people have continued to think about this we have some propositions okay so these are two propositions regarding the Carnot cycle efficiency a proposition is slightly lesser than a law a law is something that every science and every observation we have so far confirms okay a proposition is sort of a derivation from one of those theories so two propositions so it's a little less than a law um, but what it says is it's impossible now there we go again right this we're back to these possible and impossible but it's impossible to construct an engine that operates between two thermal reservoirs so maybe that boiling water and that ice bath okay and that is any more efficient than a reversible engine operating between those so the thermal efficiency of a reversible engine is going to be more than the thermal efficiency of anything I could really build. Okay? And that just simply makes sense because if you think about, you know, like friction losses that I'm not going to be able to reclaim, all of those things, this just feels logical. Okay? And observations continue to hold it out to support it. So, a second proposition is that all engines that operate on a Carnot cycle, no matter how I figure out to do it okay maybe I'm going to have multiple steps whatever but anyway I do this on a Carnot cycle so a Carnot cycle driving a Carnot cycle whatever between two given constant temperature reservoirs any way I do it gonna have the same efficiency so that means it's a function only of those two temperatures the high and low temperature now we can stretch this a little bit further and one of the interesting things that I can do is I can then use this to really define thermodynamic temperature I don't know if you recall but back at the beginning of the course I said defining temperature is a lot harder than you think it is you feel like you understand temperature but you probably really don't <laughs> okay and we had the zeroth law that said that if two objects were in equilibrium thermal equilibrium with each other and then one of them was in equilibrium with a third then the first one was in equilibrium with the third okay but now then we can actually use this to describe a temperature scale and this says that based on a Carnot cycle I could describe a temperature scale that doesn't matter about what I'm using to measure it okay it just is about the properties I mean uh, just about the temperatures okay so there's an absolute temperature scale not just a relative one now I am skipping the derivations of this at this point in time there are some of some of it's in your book a lot of it you if you do a graduate level course in thermodynamics you'll do a little bit more with this but some of the important results that we get is that the ratio of heat transfer rates QH over QL high temperature over low temperature for a reversible is exactly the same as the ratio of the temperatures okay now I have to take into account signs these are absolute values so since I know one's in one is out it's negative TH over TL but this is an absolute temperature scale these are both positive values if I say that the thermal efficiency is network over QH, which I said then would be the same as 1 plus QL over QH, this is negative, this is positive. Well, QL over QH, if it's reversible, is TL over TH, but negative. So for reversible, I can define it this way, but I can for anything define it as work over QH. And I can do the same thing for refrigerators where I 
take these you know, QL over QH ratios and put them in. So for reversible refrigerator, I get 1 over TH over TL minus 1. And for reversible heat pump, I get 1 over 1 minus TL over TH. Now one last little topic we want to cover in this video. And this is the ideal gas temperature scale. And basically this says that I can define a temperature scale based on any single fixed point. So give me a fixed point, say the triple point of water. You tell me what that pressure and temperature you want them to be. And I can develop a scale based on that. Okay. Really what it says is if I say that the critical temperature or the triple point temperature of water is 273.16 and I know the pressure at that triple point, then the temperature is that value and then a ratio of the pressures. Okay. I get a very simple minded temperature scale. Turns out that this ideal gas temperature scale is exactly the same temperature scale as we've been calling Kelvin in SI units or Rankine in English units. So we're going to stop right there and we're going to come back and talk about how we can compare ideal and real machines, processes, cycles.